you're right, to go over the crunching that's going on, I need to need a microphone. So I'm delighted that we have uh, Dr. Sarah Dunn with us today. She's coming from uh, Newcastle University in the UK and is uh, in the structural engineering department. She has a background in civil and structural for all the engineering types among us who want to keep track of those things. Um, and I'm really excited to hear her talk today. She has devoted her research to looking at modeling uh, very complex systems and some of the um, complex stressors on systems, particularly infrastructure as it relates to you know, social and economic impact. And of course, that's something that we're very interested in here in uh, GRI. The other part of her talk that I uh, think you're going to really enjoy is her focus looking at the utilization of weather forecasting and translating that into impact and consequence as opposed to, as we were just discussing up here, what really is kind of um, a social currency, in, at least here in the U.S. and other Western areas where we like to talk about the forecast, right? We have lots of them. And uh, they may not have any real relationship to accuracy of what happens, but they become something we talk about. So she's going to talk about how she, her research is looking at utilizing that kind of information in terms of impact and consequences um, of, uh, on, on the infrastructure and events. So let me turn it over to Sarah. And thank you for being here with us. We're just delighted. Thank you for having me. Um, thank you for a great introduction as well. I don't, yeah, I've got to try and follow that now. Okay, yeah, I'm Sarah from, uh, from Newcastle. In case none of you know where Newcastle is, I always just start with a, a brief slide of a where we are. So, um, just northeast England for us. Um, about two days of the year, it looks like this, quite nice and sunny. This is ridiculously hot for me, so this is lovely. Um, I am like plastered in sun lotion at the minute, because otherwise I would just fry. Um, but it's a beautiful campus. If you ever get the chance to come, please do come. More than happy to have visitors as well visiting us. Just to give you an idea of the, the rest of the research team as well um, that we have at Newcastle and just some of the other experts that I kind of work with. So we've got Professor Rich Dawson, who's in uh, systems engineering. Um, Sean, who is my PhD supervisor, um, is in structural engineering. He's mainly looking at earthquakes and their impacts to buildings as well, but also crosses into the infrastructure resilience. Um, we've got Haley, who looks at climate change aspects, a few GIS experts, and Jaime, who's kind of our policy and environmental guy as well. I don't really need the background on me at the minute because I had a very good, good background. Um, but yeah, I'm a civil and structural engineer by trade. Um, background PhD in network graph analysis applied to infrastructure systems. Um, I then moved on and did a one-year research fellowship looking, bringing climate change basically into what I was doing. I'm now a lecturer in structural engineering, which is I'm going to put myself somewhere between your assistant and associate professor, because I am tenured, but I'm not senior, so try and work that one out. Um, for the, okay, so into the, the kind of meat of what, we, what we're discussing. So my main research area um, is anything to do with improving the resilience of our communities by looking at techniques that can identify fragile system architectures. So in terms of topology, what's connected to what, recognize specific vulnerable areas within these systems, so are there specific areas that we need to protect in order to ensure the resilience of the whole system? Um, and establish methods that can protect them from a range of hazards as well. Okay, so I've looked at a little bit of rail. Um, electricity networks are our main focus at the minute. I've done a bit on roads, um, air traffic networks. Hazards, oh, flooding, winds, ash clouds, anything with a spatial component basically, which is anything in terms of sort of weather related events. I've done a little bit on terrorist and targeted attacks, but not too much on that. Unfortunately, the work I did on that can't actually be published, so that's quite good fun. Um, okay, so the fragility of our infrastructure systems. So this is always a, a really good example that I use just to show how fragile these systems are. A lot of you probably nod because you probably know about this one. Um, North American blackout 2003 had massive, massive effects. So um, we had a, an image of about 20 hours before the blackout and one seven hours after. Um, you guys in Boston were actually pretty okay. You had power. It didn't really affect you too much. Um, lived in Montreal, Ottawa, Toronto, uh, anywhere around Cleveland, Columbus, you had a few problems. That might all look quite well and good. So, you know, power was affected. Right, so what? 
Well, actually, it was affected on one of the hottest days during the year. Um, you had to walk home. Shame. No underground running. I think it, it actually produced a very pretty skyline, from what I quite like, and I, you know, appreciate things. But there was no aircon. People suffered massively on the ground. You might think that was caused by a massive event. Something huge hit the, the power network, you know, big storm came in, something like that. No. One power station went offline, and it was basically the inability of the operators to realise what that one power station meant to the functioning of the network that ca caused all of this damage. Okay, it caused a cascading failure, started somewhere, and then just blew up the whole of the system. Okay, partly due to uh, not managing tree growth around lines as well. Lines, when they get too much current on them, start expanding. They start sagging, hit trees, that blows out. And that all just cascaded throughout the whole system. When it starts, there's not a lot you can do to stop it. You've just got to let it keep going until it eventually reaches stability, uh, which is around this point here. And then you can start repairing it. Yes, yeah, so it's not just large scale things that affect our infrastructure. I talk about resilience quite a lot on resilient infrastructure, and it means completely different things to a lot of different people. Um, so just to give you an example, got four sort of basic definitions there. One taken from the standard Oxford Dictionary. Um, this is our nice English version. You, you might have something slightly different over here, but that's ours. Um, ecology, systems information engineering, risk management. Essentially, what I, I kind of take from that is they're all looking at bouncing back. They're all looking to get back to something good enough, quick enough. It's kind of the, the definition of resilience that I take. Okay, can you get back, not necessarily to your original state, but can you get back to something that is good enough and in a quick enough time scale? That depends on the system. It depends on the damage. It's got a whole heap of, of sort of things that go with it. UK government um, came up, oh, about 2011 now, um, with its own definition of resilience. Well, it didn't come up with the definition of resilience. It came up with four parts that form resilience uh, and four elements of this. So resilience, according to us, is basically a resistance element, providing strength to resist the hazard. Reliability component, is it designed to operate under a range of conditions? Redundancy, have you got backup capacity in there or spare capacity so when something goes wrong, you can swap your system over? And response and recovery, can you enable fast effective response to actually recover from these disruptive events? The research that I do tends to focus on the reliability and redundancy aspects, but I've done a little bit on response and recovery and some small aspects on resistance as well. Okay, so I'm mainly reliability and redundancy for me. Okay, I just thought I would kind of break this down into to three chunks. So I thought it was the easiest way of doing it. Um, of chunks of research that I've done that I think might be most interesting to you at the moment. Okay. So this is where it all started with a spatial hazard tolerance of infrastructure. Okay, this is what I did for some of my PhD work and I've come on since. This is what we have. So this is a water distribution network. Okay, somewhere in Poland, I think this one. So we've got various water sources and various communities demanding a supply of water. This is a physically based model. Um, it's quite difficult to analyze in terms of resilience. You'd have to do a whole heap of analysis to actually get there. So what I did is model this network as a series of nodes and links forming network graph theory. And if you do that, you come down to something that looks a lot more friendly. And various researchers have looked at this in the past. I've heard quite a few people talk about Barabasi, and you've got their book sitting on your desk, um, who found out actually quite a lot of our infrastructure has an underlying network architecture. Okay, that's just different patterns of connectivity in the nodes and links. Okay? Think of it as a bit like a fingerprint on the system. And two main types of networks that infrastructure fall into, one is just called scale-free, the other one's called exponential. Basically, both of them consist of a very small number of high degree nodes, which we call hubs. So that could be your power station, which has a whole heap of connections out to it, to the communities that it serves, and a very large number of small degree nodes. Okay, so these would be the communities that might only have one link to power coming into it, okay, one or two. And they're all characterized by what we call degree distribution. If you're not familiar with it, don't panic. Okay, it's just a bit like a fingerprint of a network. It just tells me what's connected to what and how much is connected. Okay. Previous application of network theory um, put it to communication networks, power grids, transportation, water distribution systems. Okay. The advantage of doing this is because if you identify the network architecture and you know the topology of the system, 
you can get a very good understanding quite quickly of its hazard tolerance, okay, without having to do a whole heap of analysis. However, what we found um, was that the spatial component of these real-world networks received much less attention when it wasn't neglected entirely. Okay, and these studies were just focusing on topology only. You might not think it's too much of a, a problem till this came along. Okay, here we go. The Ayajalafajalkal volcano in Iceland, I practiced that one, um, a disrupted European airspace okay, for a number of days because 10 million air passengers delayed, 1.7 billion US dollars in economic losses. That was a massive, massive thing for us that nobody really saw coming. Um, so what we did is create a map of the network, um, 525 airports, 3,886 air routes, just within Europe on this one, so we weren't looking at flights connected outside, we just focused on, on the European network itself. We subjected this network um, to the closures that we had of airspaces during each day of the disaster. Okay? So the grey areas are the airspaces that were closed, therefore those airports weren't able to operate, therefore the air routes weren't able to operate as well. Okay, so we took all those out of the system, saw how much was still operational, again on the 21st. And if we plot that as a series of closed area um, and cancelled routes, what we actually see um, is that the network was particularly vulnerable to this event. Okay, but this network is exponential. Um, network theory tells us because it's exponential, the ash cloud is a random hazard. It didn't specifically target these hub degree nodes. Okay, it wasn't trying to create huge impact to the network, it should have been resilient to this hazard. So we had to have a look and see what was actually going on. So what we did um, was we looked at its degree distribution and we tried to create a series of synthetic networks to have a look and see if they shared the same characteristics as the real world network when disrupted as well. So we created the, the Barabasi scale free network, um, as you can see, doesn't really fit the black line very much, okay, wasn't a great model in this case. So we, we performed a, a few different rules and transformed it slightly. More happy to go into that with the, the network theory geeks later. Okay, um, and came with a blue line, which matches much better. Okay, so we were able to recreate the network architecture, but we also needed to recreate the spatial characteristics as well. Okay, so this is just plotting the distance from the midpoint of the, the network and the cumulative degree of all the nodes as you grow outside. Scale-free network, you can see it, it's okay, but it underestimates here, then it's over at the top. Exponential blue line was again a lot better, okay? So it showed our, our new networks were a lot better fit. So we subjected our new networks to exactly the same disruption that the European air traffic network had faced. And we found that actually we got pretty similar results. It's slightly different when you're down the bottom, closing small A spaces, but very similar for the rest, okay? In terms of nodes removed and in terms of area removed as well. So what we showed that actually was this exponential network was vulnerable to this random hazard, which previous network theory said it should be resilient, okay? And that's because its network architect, well, sorry, its network architecture was taken into account, but not its spatial characteristics. So we furthered that a little bit and had a look at other systems, um, creating different network classes, different node introduction orders. Basically, this just gave us a whole spread of nodes and different spatial areas and different nodal configurations and saw what we came up with. Give you a bit of an example, this is the effect of high degree node location, okay, so this is a network where the black nodes, well the black dots are the high degree nodes, so they're nice and spread out, and this one they're clustered around the middle, okay. Put the same hazard on, just the middle, grow it outwards, okay. You can see the, the effect of putting all your nodes in the center compared to spraying it out, you've got a much more vulnerable network. Other side, we had a look at just clustering all the nodes in the middle, and if we spread them out uniform with area as well. And you can see that one creates a much, much more devastating impact in terms of the number of links removed. This network, you've got to remove about 2% of the network and you get 40% of your links removed. Okay, so let's work on the left. Its architecture tells you it's resilient. Actually, its spatial characteristics tell you it's inherently vulnerable. Okay, so we did a lot of work in that area. If you're interested, point you to the papers to read. Okay. Um, Real-time infrastructure forecasting, this is the one I want to get into because I thought this is the one that, that kind of is more interesting to most of you, okay? So we move from a network theory background into forecasting, which we call consequence forecast modeling, okay? This is our model that we've taken. If any of you have used catastrophe risk modeling or cat modeling before, 
It's a very similar framework to that, but we've had to modify it. So we're not taking into account building, building stock, but taking into account networks. Okay, so it's a bit of a change. Essentially, you start with some form of event or a trigger. Okay, so this is either a weather event, so a windstorm, heat wave, rainfall. And you change that because you need information on the duration, intensity, and location of that event. Okay, the more detailed you can get it, the better. We then use that event sort of generation and come up with intensity calculations. Okay, so this is one windstorm moving across the UK. Um, red being quite high wind speed areas, green being the low wind speed. And you can see it as it comes across the south coast and tracks up the country in there. Okay. With that intensity calculation, you also need the exposure information as well. Okay. So this is data regarding your infrastructure component and where it's located. Where it's located is the minimum information you need okay, in order to do this. If you have information about its age, about its maintenance, about how it's been upkept, the, the type of component, the materials used, that's much better as well, and it can help refine the analysis later. What we have, Western Power Distribution, uh, one of the companies we work with, this is their sort of electricity network, so there's a power line there, sorry, a power station. Um, various transmission lines coming out from it as well. Um, water sound, that one, bridge is the other. Okay, it doesn't matter on the type of infrastructure, just need the information where it is. If you combine both of these together, so the intensity calculation and the exposure information, so you work out for each of your infrastructure asset locations what the intensity is, you can work out the damage estimation. Okay, are you expecting that piece of infrastructure to pass or fail? Okay. And that could be power lines coming down in a windstorm. It could be, this is a big one that happened in the UK. This is our Dawlish Railway. It kind of, well, we built it a bit too close to the coast and then it eroded and, and fell in the sea. Uh, but we can't change it because it's a historic monument, so we have to keep it, but never mind. Um, and then bridge fail as well when its abutment collapses. And then from the damage, you can then track this through the system. This is where our system analysis comes in a bit to work out the consequences as well. So whether that's in terms of estimated economic cost, just a random scale, um, green being okay, red being sort of not okay, we don't want. Um, you can see this one has come out as, as quite red in there, okay? But it could be economic cost, it could be societal sort of impacts, so it could be the number of people without power, um, the diversion route that you've had to take to your journey because your road's closed, whatever it is that you're interested in. As soon as you know that information, uh, we then bring it down and that you can take various contingency actions in order to try and mitigate that as well. Okay. We have got now as well, if you've taken the contingency actions to come back up here and we work it through as well. So you can keep going around um, till you get sort of the consequences that's acceptable to you. Damage estimation is kind of the, the key to all of this, really. If you get the damage estimation right, the rest of the model, I think, will, will pretty much fall into place for you. Okay, this is the one that is quite data intensive. It's achieved through the use of fragility or vulnerability curves. This is what we use. Okay, So for something like flooding, we expect it to be quite a binary sort of instance. If you take a power station, for example, specifically in the UK, if you get to one meter flood depth, your power station's failed, it's gone. Okay comes above the circuit breakers, that's it, it goes. If it's ending below that, your substation's still operational, no worries, okay? Wind speed, it's a lot more variable, okay? We have, we start off with kind of an S-curve coming in. UK, we've never got to this bit yet, this would be total failure of the system, as much as I'd love to get there. Um, I don't think anybody else would. Um, so <laughs> we've got this aspect of the curve at the moment, okay? There you go. So they can be derived uh, through empirical or analytical methods. So either using real fault data or using structural models to actually interpret it through. So this is our modeling framework. So they fit in there. Okay. So what we've applied it to in our terms is electricity resilience. So windstorms in the UK are the greatest cause of faults to the electricity network that we have, okay? specifically the distribution network. Our transmission network doesn't tend to fail. I think has a 99.999% reliability. Um, it's quite gold-plated, the national grid love it. Doesn't really fail too much, which is good. Um, 
But windstorms cause a massive amount of, of damage for us every year, okay, every winter. So what we have got as part of our event, these are our weather forecasts. So we've worked with the Met Office who provide weather forecasts for us. Okay, and we get them, this is real time, so this is T0, that's what actually happened. Six hours before it was forecast, 12 and 24 hours before the actual weather storm hit. Okay, so they give us all the forecasts that we've got. I'll play it again, don't worry. Okay. If I do play it again, you can see there's the main part of the storm coming in now, tracking across there. It captures quite well between everything, but there is a lot of change between what was forecasted 24 hours previously and what actually happened on the ground as well. But obviously, if you're trying to forecast what's going to happen to infrastructure in real time, you need to be using these forecasts and not kind of the, the one that's happening now, in order to give people a bit of warning. Okay. Uh, let's come down one. Um, and this gives us, so this is the maximum wind speed that actually occurred. So in reality, the south of Wales, um, just on the coast here, we had a few very high spots of wind speeds, about 40 miles an hour, I think we had, yeah. Sorry, 40 meters per second. Um, six hours out, we were forecast, yeah, okay, it's got it in about the right location, but this bit isn't quite as intense as we wanted. 24 hours out, nothing there. Okay, so it's, it's coming up with ways as well that can manage this and can deal with kind of forecasts that are not quite accurate for us. Exposure information we use, so we work with Western Power Distribution, um, it's part of the UK. They're quite good because they cover a lot of a wide area basically. So they cover South Wales, um, the southwest of England, which gets clobbered by windstorms virtually every year. Um, the Midlands and the East Coast, which doesn't get too much windstorm within there. So we can have a look and basically see if the fragility functions we, we come up with for one side of the system actually match the other as well within there. This is the distribution network we've got in the UK. So this is transmission, this is owned by the National Grid uh, for the whole of the UK. And the distribution, sorry, the energy distribution companies, these guys pull off at grid supply points and own the system all the way down till it enters your house. Okay. It's mainly the HV part of the network, the 11 kV stuff that they're interested in that has the most faults on it. They're mainly interested as well because it's one part of the system that is not parallel lines. Okay? This system is all parallel, it's backed up. One line fails, you've still got the other to get a good quantity of electricity through. This one you haven't, but if you've got a primary substation, you're still looking at 50,000 homes without power potentially within there as well, which is quite a big number. So you've got the exposure information, so I have all the information on where the overhead lines are, the towers and poles, substations and underground cables. We've got a bit of extra information on that as well, so I know when they're installed, how well they're maintenance, and what they're made of as well within there. Huge data sets. Um, fault information we've got, so we've worked them to get their, their fault information. So this is to produce our fragility curves. We do have a database with over 200,000 faults in it. Um, 25,000 faults are appropriate in this case. So this is faults that have occurred from 2010, because that's when they re really trust their data. They think it was audited from that point. Although we have done analysis for their data in 2000, um, and it shows no different in trends from 2010 onwards. So we think it's fine to use, but they don't want to. It's fine. Um, for that and for the South Wales kind of area. So quite a few faults to be getting on with. The faults, what we get is we get the date down to the exact second that the fault occurred. We get the cause of the fault. So there was wind and gale, rain, lightning, snow, ice. And sometimes they even put a secondary cause in there as well. So if they think it was caused by sort of wind, but the secondary cause was rain um, to that, because that may be to stabilize the ground, they'll put that on as well, which is good extra information for us. We've got the duration of the fault. Um, we've got the approximate location. So it doesn't give us the exact GPS location of the fault, but it tells us which line it was on. So if we go back to the exposure information, I can get a pretty good idea of exactly where this line is. And I've got the number of consumers affected in there as well, so how big it was. Some of them you think will be, will be quite big faults and would affect quite a few consumers. Actually, they're not, okay, in there. But about 225,000 faults, okay. I had no idea why that appeared in there because it should be there. Um, so if we combine that with our wind speeds, um, what we get is this average agility curve that comes in here, 
we have a huge amount of scatter within the curve, but actually if we take the averages, put integer value of wind speed, and plot those on a straight line, well, on a curve coming through, we get quite a good uh, correlation between the two in there, okay? We're looking at ways as well at the minute of how we take this, this scatter into account and what we do with it. So if we put all that together in our model, okay, so we start off with our events, we come through, we pass it through the fertility curves, and we see what we get out at the end in consequences. These are some of the, the initial results we've got to date, okay? So we're working on making these a bit better if we can. So we've got different storms, okay? And these are different areas within the, the part of the national, not the national grid, within part of Western Power, okay? So we've plotted for 24 hours out, 12, and what actually happens, okay? Using the weather, passing it through our model. The red line is the number of faults that did actually occur, okay? And the black bar is what we've said is the num what should be the number of faults that is occurring, okay? Within various bins that we've got. So you can see for the top one, for 24 hours out, we got it right, we correlated, um, but then the forecast would have changed, so actually we're under-predicting for the other two, okay? Second one down, again, we're under-predicting for all. Top one, again, under-predicting because the wind speeds were not as we were expecting. Second one down, though, bang on all the time, okay? These ones, are, I think, were quite interesting. Um, so this one, again, bang on with everything. This one, for some reason, um, what they had for wind speeds estimated 24 hours out were massively higher than what actually experienced in reality. Um, so we were sort of saying this, this should be quite a huge storm. Actually, then the forecast re came back out for 12 hours, passed that through the model. With the much lower wind speeds now, you're getting a much lower fault. Okay, so that just shows the variability that you can have in the weather forecast that we get and how much effect that has to the model coming through as well. So that's our modeling framework. Um, we are working at the minute to try and make it so it runs, well, basically by itself, okay? So it'll keep on going through. So we can start off with our windstorm coming in um, and it'll just keep calculating itself till we get to the consequences, okay? So it will give us probably an email or a text message or something like that just to kind of go, you know, bing, you're expecting a windstorm in, you know, 12 hours time. Um, you're expecting this many faults. This is what's gonna happen, you know? So we know to keep an eye on things as well and we can let Western Power know. We're working with them throughout the whole of this to see what they need for their systems as well, to see how they forecast and mobilize people as well. So they're working on the minute, if we can give them an idea the day before, what the wind speeds might be the next day and if they're gonna have any problems, they can mobilize teams, get them into operation um, and, and ready to fix faults essentially as they occur within this. We've done it for wind speeds at the moment. There's no reason why this couldn't be done for other types of hazards. I previously said, you know, you could do for heat waves, you could do it for flooding. Um, you just need to change the event trigger that comes through and change the damage estimation so the fragility curves that are there, okay? That's the key component, get that bit right, and the rest of it should just fall into place. Within literature, there are some quite good fragility curves now just starting to come through. It's basically, it's a new area for research within this. Um, but they're starting to come through. Our curves are out there in literature. Please feel free to use it. It'd be quite interesting to see actually um, whether they translate to other countries as well. We're currently working with Australia on some of their um, fragility for systems. The initial results and the initial analysis shows that actually our systems in the UK are much more resilient to windstorms than theirs are. Um, but that's quite good. We can then start learning from each other. We can then pull that back to look at the structural codes and kind of see right how they design their overhead lines and towers how are we designing ours and how do we change from there as well, okay? And that's another big one as well, to have a look at contingency actions, what you can do in terms of effects for all of this as well. We've also had a look back as well at some of the consequences. Um, it's trying to relay our results date with consumers without power, okay? It's all very well to know sort of how many faults you're expecting. The operators find that absolutely brilliant, okay? Because they know how many teams to mobilize, um, in order to sort of repair crews, where to put people as well on the ground before the storm hits so they can come up with stuff and sort of fix fault very quickly afterwards. The regulators in the UK, so Ofgem, who regulates um, our sort of electricity generation um, industries, they rely on consumers without power. So they will issue fines um, to distribution companies if they've got a certain number of consumers without power for a certain number of time scale. 
it is dependable on that. You know, it's either a huge consumer that power for a small time scale or a very few for a, for a large time scale on there. So we've looked at, at kind of predicting, okay, we might have 20 faults coming to the system, right, but how many consumers of that power does that relate into? Okay. So what we did is we took back and we looked at uh, previous windstorms and we calculate the number of faults that they had within them. Um, we then calculate the consumers of that power due to those windstorms as well. Um, plotted a line through, trend line through, R squared, 0.7, so it's not brilliant, um, but it is quite a good basis. This is for the HV part of the network, okay? So relationship is about Y of 300X, okay? Um, and the LV network as well. Plotted that one through, Y is about 8X this time as well, okay? So for the number of faults you have on the LV network, times by eight, that gives you the rough number of consumers you've got without power. For the HV network, you can see why they're much more interested in it. Um, times the number of faults by 300 this time, and you've got the rough consumers without power, okay? We've actually applied both of these to the results we've got so far, and they're in a pretty good ballpark, okay? So even though we've got lower char squared values with, with a bit of a scatter on there, they're actually pretty accurate when we've applied it to the faults that we've looked at so far. Extra little topic, so this is what I'm currently looking at at the minute as well. So this is a, an ongoing research project, this one, looking at resource location, okay? Basically, in the event of a natural disaster, um, it's important that you've got critical resources located in effective locations, okay? Looking at minimizing travel time from where they're stored to when they're needed. So this is either for deployment pre-disaster or deployment post-disaster, okay? Either or doesn't make too much of a difference. So I'm working with the national grid at the minute. Um, so in the UK, we currently have to design sort of flood defences for 100 years plus climate change within there. Unfortunately, um, national grid had a site in sort of northwest of, of England. They designed it for 100 years plus climate change, put in permanent flood defences. We had a storm two years ago. So this is one year after the defence was built and they were breached. It went over the top, okay. Um, <laughs> big oops moment later, and they went, yeah, we're not gonna do that anymore. We're gonna to move to demountable flood defenses. So because climate change is so variable, we've got no idea what's going on. Uh, well, some small idea um, within there. I'm, I apologize if there's any climate scientists in there, but your models have so much scatter in them, it's ridiculous. Um, so they don't know what's gonna happen. So instead of investing in all of their sites for permanent flood defenses and, and building huge walls that are so high, what they've got is demountable flood defenses, so these are stored basically on the back of a truck. When they're, they're forecast for, for a flooding event, they ship them out uh, and they place them around their site, okay? And they can change the height that these defenses are, build them up to, to whatever height they think they might need, okay? So they've moved much more to the demountable sites. Unfortunately, the issue you have with demountable sites is where on earth do you put them, okay? They've got them stored in one site at the minute. They've got them somewhere in Doncaster, which is about there in the UK, which I think is fine because it covers Northern England quite well. Um, but the southerners are not too sure, okay? So the question I got asked by the national grid was where, where should we site our demandable flood defenses? So, right, okay. So we took, this is all of the, the substation sites in the UK, okay? Um, we took then, so flooding maps uh, provided by the Environment Agency. Um, based on historical flooding, the little fact of a climate change in there as well, uh, for flooding hazard for high, medium and very low, and pulled out anything that was at risk of flooding currently. And then because we don't trust them, we also put a small buffer around it as well and took those sites into account as well, okay? That gave us our sites that we need to protect in some way, shape or form. So what we did was we applied a, what's called a location allocation analysis within ArcGIS. Basically looks at kind of saying, right, so you've got all your sites. I've got a road network as well. And I know the road speeds that go on that. Where should I put my location, so my flood defenses, in order to minimize the travel time to all of these sites? Okay, that's what it was looking at. So if we're only gonna put one location in place, it wants it just outside of London. Ooh, not good. Okay, wants it just outside of there. So plot the distance um, that we get for all of our substations that are away from this site area. Yeah, and the number of substations. All the drop lines are the very ones that are high risk of flooding, okay? So those are the ones that we're most interested in are the drop lines. So you can see we're quite good. We've got a few down the bottom, 
few clusters in the middle, but there's one here that we're clearly not protecting very well in northern England. What you can do, though, is you can split the amount of defense you've got, so you can put it in two locations this time. Okay. If we ran the model and we wanted it, and we said, right, put it in the best two locations for us, optimize that, it still kept this one just outside of London, but it put one where the national grid prefers you have it now, outside Doncaster, which is quite interesting. Um, and one location up here, so you can see we minimize the travel time, mainly to, to get to all the sites. We've still got one outlier up here, which is our nice one, over down here somewhere, um, which is still requiring quite a lot of travel time to get to it. Okay. What we did then is we split it down again further and we went for three resource locations. Again, this one just introduced a new location for us just outside of Cardiff. Again, minimized travel time, much lower time now. Okay. So you can get to all substation sites very, very quickly within this. I just think it's interesting to note when you've got one, two, and three locations, something that we didn't expect was that our first location was located just outside of London. When we introduced the second location, this one stayed pretty much. Moved a small amount, but it didn't move very much, and we introduced a new location in the north of England. When we went for three locations, these two moved again, but only again by a very small amount. The third came in just by Cardiff. So I thought that was quite interesting because I expect them to move quite a bit around the, the country, but they actually really didn't um, within that. We also consider as well um, sort of the, the amount of time that you travel on local roads. Okay, so one of the early meetings I had with the National Grid as I asked them, right, okay, so you've got a guy who's got his truck with these sort of flood defences and needs to get to this substation site. How does he get there? And they went, well, he follows his sat nav. That is brilliant. What if this flooded roads? They went, oh, we didn't think of that. <laughs> right, okay. So we had a look at um, the local roads as well. Um, so these being the routes that you would take from the substation site to get to your major highway roads. Okay, so our major motorways and highways in the UK generally don't flood. Um, they've got very good, flood, flood, very good flood resilience within them. Okay, but our local roads do flood quite a lot. Okay, so we had a look at routes to get there. Um, and then came up with another risk sort of of the, the roads and how likely they were to flood as well. Do we have other options for getting the defences in and out? So sort of how much journey time does that add to it as well? So what we've just done is we've gone back and we've put an extra risk factor in for each of our substation sites in the UK. And we'll just rerun the analysis just briefly, just to see if this makes a, look, a difference to where you would actually site your defences as well. Now knowing um, that some of these substation sites might be quite inaccessible it's sometimes a flood or not as well, okay? They do aim to get, obviously, the, the defences in before the river does actually flood and burst its banks, but in some cases, it's just not possible, okay? We're currently looking as well at the hazard tolerance of these systems. So one thing we're looking at is the amount of defence that you need to store at each site, okay, in order to access everything around it. They don't have enough amount of defences in order to, to protect every substation site in the UK at once. Okay, they've got enough to do, let's say, six or seven, okay, which we tend to have quite localised flooding. It's quite bizarre for us to have flooding in, say, the northwest and the southeast at the same time. Okay. So we're currently having a look at that. We're also having a look at a little bit of what I've kind of called the hazard tolerance of it as well. So this being, if you've got three substation, sorry, three location sites, okay, your northern one becomes inoperable for some reason. Okay. Either your trucks just aren't working, you've got no resource stored there, it's compromised itself by some form of hazard. Okay. Then you've got to get your resource now from the bottom two, so the one in Cardiff and London, up to the north of England. Okay. Obviously that adds on increased travel time. Is that risk worth it? That's what we're generally asking at the minute. And putting that back as well to the national grid and letting them decide that. Okay. So all we're coming up with here, yes, hello. <clears throat> Yeah, so they're all about the same size. Um, they all, it's hard to tell when it serves the same number of customers because there's transmission grids coming off of a distribution, um, but they are all equally important, I'd say, to the functioning of that as well, yeah. There's also, I haven't pointed out within this as well, there's also six substations um, that the national grid must keep running in the event of a black start. So a black start is, if you don't know, it's when your whole grid goes down and you have absolutely nothing, no power, no nothing working. You can't just flick the switch and get the whole system back on. You've got to start it off very, very slowly. Okay, that's why we've still got coal-fired power stations in the UK. 
I've been told we need at least one in the event of a black star um, because it, it gives out regular sort of power, essentially, unlike solar and, and wind. To get that running, you start off with a very small system and then you slowly build it up from there. Okay, so there are six substation sites in the UK that must run on a black star event. Three of them are in flood locations. That was well planned. Um, they're all outside of London and they're all in flood locations. Um, so hopefully that will never happen. So that's also factored into our analysis a little bit as well, which is possibly why it locates down London quite, quite a lot. Um, yeah, so we're currently having a look at what happens if you, if you remove that as well. Okay, and have a look at the hazard torrents. that answer your question? Yeah, okay. There as well. Um, basically what we're, what we're trying to do is just come up with sort of a range of options and a range of sort of risks to present back to the national grid. Okay, to kind of go, right, you guys run the system, you guys operate it, you have to report to the regulators. What do you think is an acceptable risk for this? Okay, we're not going to tell you how to run your system. I've run the analysis. I know what I think should happen, but it's up to you in your systems to what you want um, to happen and what you consider acceptable as well. That's where I'm at with that one. Other bits of research that I've done that just didn't really have time yeah, to include in all of this. Okay, I thought I'd give a brief summary. Then if you want any information, just, just shout. Okay, I've done lots and bits of pieces. Um, so firstly, the, the results that we did with the air traffic networks, um, that's also been applied to China and the US. You guys have a very interesting scenario. I love it. Completely different to, to the European air traffic network. All our hub airports are in one location in the middle. Yours are on the east and west coastlines. And you've got nothing in the middle in terms of hub airports. It's great. Um, yeah, but it's great. But you take out one coastline and your country still functions because you've got the other coastline. Uh, you take out the middle of Europe, we just don't function um, within that. So that's there. Um, looked at a few methods to increase the resilience of air traffic networks. So either an adaptive and permanent strategy as well. Permanent is when we get rid of basically the hub airports and we sort of say it's a random network where everybody has the same number of connections going to it. Adaptive is when we sort of said, right, okay, so you can't fly to the airport you wanted to go to because it's affected by hazard. Let's put you to the next closest airport um, on land and go there. And we found actually the adaptive strategy had the most potential in moving forward. Okay. Um, I've also looked at the analysis of IMT interdependent infrastructure systems. Um, so having a look at if you've got an electricity network and a water network coupled together, how does a failure in the electricity network impact the water system in there as well? Okay. For those of you who do network theory, um, we apply percolation to that. Showed it was absolutely rubbish for looking at infrastructure networks. Okay. Um, it doesn't matter if the largest cluster is together. Okay. What matters is where the source nodes are within it. Um, if you've got a system that's all functioning, Brilliant, but if it's all housing and there's no electricity generation going on, people don't have power. Um, so, yeah, we looked at changing that a little bit in there. I've also done stuff with identifying specific vulnerable components in infrastructure systems as well, um, combining network theory and physically based metrics within it just to see what picked it out. You know, so network theory, do we use the degree of the node? Do I use between the centrality? Um, and then physically based, do I use the flow going through the node as well? So which one highlights the most important? And we showed it was actually a combination of the both that showed it in there. Slightly different application network theory to pumping stations in Jakarta. So this is work I did with the University of Wollongong in Australia. Um, so looking at how to identify the vulnerability of trash, sorry, of pumping stations to trash blockage. So this was looking at the length of the river that was upstream, the amount of trash that was thrown in normally, um, and the vulnerability of, of pumping stations there as well. Um, and currently doing a little bit of work as well on modeling honeybee nests completely different, uh, with agent-based models and network theory models. What we're trying to do is identify the tipping point of bee removal, which leads to the collapse of a colony, okay? I did not know you had differences between nectar bees, pollen bees, there was workers, there's foragers, um, there's the ones that look after the nest and the little bees, um, but they can change roles occasionally, and they take a couple of days to change roles, but they can still do it, and oh yeah. It's a great system, but I've learned more about honeybees than I ever thought I would. Um, so network theory within there. So it's the same modeling that's used for infrastructure, but you can use it for a lot of other things in there as well. Um, summary. So I've gone through an awful lot and I never really know how to end all of this. So I go through it with a Wordle. So this is my PhD thesis and the most popular of the words that I tend to ramble on about. Um, so network is my most popular word. Uh, nodes. It's quite interesting that resilience is a teeny tiny word somewhere in it, so I don't really use it a lot, which I thought was quite 
quite interesting when I, at the end when I did all this. Uh, but how does spatial infrastructure in there? Not very resilient now. Oh, you're oh yeah, 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 there, there. So still quite small in there, yeah. Vulnerability will be in there somewhere as well uh, within that. So yeah, just a, a quick acknowledgement as well. Um, so we've got a lot of information from Met Office, NG Network Association and Western Power, who we tend to work with to do a lot of mainly the forecasting stuff. Um, and the two big funders for, for us for this research, EPSERC and NERC in there as well. So yeah, thank you very much. That was a very whistle-stop tour of research.